And many of you watching this video may have been hurt by people who had these really dark, dangerous patterns. So now imagine a person who has some of these dark patterns, but may also have what looks like empathy. Yikes. So today we're going to be talking about sort of the science of narcissism and specifically be talking about these five core elements of something called D. I know it sounds all very James Bond and menacing, but this sort of dark personality, which is represented by just the letter D. This is part of a larger long-term series of videos we're doing on the science of narcissism. I think it's absolutely essential that people understand the science behind narcissism and that I stay current on it. So we're always up to speed on what people are learning about it. Let's talk a little bit about this dark core of personality or D. Now the tough part about understanding narcissism is that it touches and is adjacent to other related personality patterns, psychopathy, sadism, paranoia, impulsivity, dysregulation, and all of these patterns raise clinical and interpersonal issues. It relates to a personality trait that has been called D. I liked it. It's like kind of foreboding, like an evil villain. And D, or the dark, which stands for the dark factor of personality. So now a lot of this research on D is attributed to Moshegan and colleagues who conceptualize D as a pattern which characterizes a person who pursues their material needs and their social needs, such as pleasure, at the expense of other people and will justify their mistreatment of other people via contempt and dismissiveness and cruel disregard for other people. In other words, they treat people like shit for their own needs and pleasure and are able to rationalize treating them like that to themselves and other people by viewing the people they mistreat as being somehow below them. And as, as, even as I'm saying it, some of you are like, yep, sounds about right. This model of D is sort of elegant and simple. The original model of D focused on a two-factor model, lack of empathy and selfishness. But in a recent paper, Bader and their colleagues at Ulm University in Germany decided to put D to the test. And they did a complex statistical analysis called a factor analysis. They wanted to see if those two factors, lack of empathy and selfishness, broke down further. A factor analysis is kind of like having a big bunch of kind of unorganized stuff in front of you. And then you run a statistic on it. And then you see how it all gets organized. Basically, the statistic figures out what concepts sort of relate or hang together and separate out from the others. It's like I said, it's like having a bunch of stuff and letting a statistic decide what stuff goes together into what drawer or cubicle together. Okay. And then based on the results of these factor analyses, how we know things hang together, we can build theories and measurements out of this. While these folks did this with D, they kind of tried to break it apart into its component parts. And they found five things that comprise this dark factor of personality. What are your guesses on what those five things are? Have fun with yourself. Drop, drop it into the comments or even make a note or even pause this video for a minute to do that. And then you can see if you're right because I'm about to tell you what those five things are. Let's see how much you know about dark personality. The analysis and the results they got was really kind of cool. It's almost like it was those Russian, those nesting dolls, the matryoshkas. Each doll you open up, there's a new doll. So they started big with the big doll, right? With the general concept of D. Well, they initially took D and broke it into the original two parts of lack of empathy and selfishness. Now, most of us would agree that these things are dark. But using that factor analysis, they were able to break these two things down further. Okay, 
lack of empathy actually broke into two pieces, callousness and sadism. Selfishness went through a few steps, but ultimately broke into vindictiveness, narcissistic entitlement, and deceitfulness. So now you can look at your answers. What were those five things? Basically, D, the dark factor of personality, boils down to callousness, sadism, vindictiveness, narcissistic entitlement, and deceitfulness. In plainer talk, D, the dark factor of personality is being cold, cruel, vindictive, entitled, and lying. Sounds like most narcissistic relationships, right? So here's the, the punchline is this, D is bad. It's bad for anyone who comes into contact with it. This collection of traits characterizes people who are willing to simply view people as disposable objects that exist solely for their needs and are able to justify the disposability of the people they encounter by writing them off as less than them and treating them with contemptuous dismissiveness. In essence, it supports the idea that people high in this D quality basically treat other human beings as trash. They use them up and they throw them out. Now, the authors of this study tested this model. They came to this final five traits by testing it in three large samples or groups of people representing respondents from nearly a hundred countries. So there was a wide range of representation. But this idea of D, I like it, it's a good model. This dark trait model in one factor captures all the stuff that makes psychopathy, sociopathy, and narcissism so difficult and dangerous for the people who encounter those D people and for the world at large. There are some really interesting parts when we kind of go deeper into what these folks were doing here. For one thing, it is that lack of empathy boiled not just into cold callousness, but there is another element to lack of empathy they found, which is sort of reckless, almost intentional disregard. This tells us that lack of empathy is a bit more nuanced than we think. And this may explain why people sometimes have very different experiences of the low empathy they run into in narcissistic people. Some people will experience a lack of empathy with a narcissistic person that is just cold, aloof, indifferent, but they aren't going out of their way to harm them. But others run into a lack of empathy in a narcissistic person that seems downright sadistic. For example, a person in a divorce going out of their way to stick it to their partner as badly as possible. That's the sadism. Lack of empathy has more texture and nuance when we break it down this way. Selfishness is very similar. When we hear that word, selfishness, we often think of selfishness as it relates to narcissism as simply being an egocentricity. But these researchers are finding something quite different and more complex. That selfishness is actually about lying, revenge, and entitlement, or the assumption of special treatment, or that the rules do not apply to them. The selfishness of D appears to be a self-serving, I can say what I want, I will lie to get what I want, I can take what I want, and heaven help anyone who stops me from getting what I want. D relates to the work that we have seen on the dark triad and dark tetrad models. Over time, I do hope we transition away from a model of just pure narcissism and into these more nuanced but also far-reaching and umbrella models like D or the dark trait model and things like antagonism. It gives us a way to talk about these patterns more broadly. But at the end of the day, 
A dark and harmful personality style is a dark and harmful personality style, whatever you call it. My hope is that seeing the science of how these traits are much more nuanced than we think, the proverbial nesting dolls as it were, can also give a sense of why people may have rather different experiences of some of these patterns, such as lack of empathy, as well as the confusion that exists between patterns like narcissism and psychopathy. It's the D stuff, all the stuff in this trait called D that hurts us and doesn't get, and, and what I like about D is they're not spending all their time asking why, what is the origin of this? It's not about the why. D is about the what. Let me tell you this, D is not a very nice what. So I hope this sort of glimpse into the science shares, sort of tells you how we can break these things down and what the science is finding about how this stuff hangs together. I share this with you because the science tells us this is all real. These are not the meanderings of what's happening in random therapy rooms or the stuff, that, the crazy stuff that comes out of my head. It's not that. It's really stuff that's grounded in science. What we've got to now do is get this to all of you so you can use this to address the patterns in your life, stop blaming yourself, and be able to move forward and recover. Thanks again. We're going to talk about something called Machiavellianism. It's a big word. But we're also going to talk about how Machiavellianism relates to narcissism. So not all narcissistic people are cunning and exploitative, like at a high level of exploitation. There are other personality styles, though, that are related to narcissism that capture a group that is ultra manipulative, self-serving, scheming, and willing to take advantage of people to get ahead no matter what. Now, who the hell was Machiavelli? Niccolo Machiavelli is a re was a Renaissance scholar who wrote a book called The Prince. And Machiavelli sounds like he was a world-class a-hole. He was a rich guy who had a privileged, rich life that I guess Italian noblemen types at that time did. And in this book, The Prince, he observed that politics has always been deceptive and manipulative and that we should simply enable and ignore the actions of awful and cruel leaders. It's kind of a guidebook to authoritarianism and basically a how-to guide on how to be an evil person. One of his well-known quotes, you got to kind of try to imagine this on his 1500s Instagram feed, is, it's better to be feared than loved. And frankly, that quote is the mantra of narcissistic and psychopathic folks everywhere. So now here we are in modern times, and in the early 1970s, Christie and Gase developed the idea of Machiavellianism as a personality trait distinct but complementary to narcissism and psychopathy. Machiavellian people have a goal or an outcome in mind, and they will scheme and plot and manipulate and do whatever is necessary to achieve that goal and will use people to achieve that goal with zero regard for who gets hurt. Even the citizens of a place where this person may be a leader, they don't care as long as they get what they need. One difference between Machiavellianism and narcissism is that Machiavellian people don't necessarily need the attention. In fact, some of them really are pretty content to be working in the back room and in the shadows, making sure that, for example, powerful people win elections or get advanced in institutional or corporate settings or other societally important spaces. Machiavellian people need the power but not necessarily the admiration and the attention. There's a lot of overlap between Machiavellianism as a personality style and psychopathy as well. However, a difference is that Machiavellian people are willing to play long games. They aren't impulsive like the psychopaths. They're not as likely to get violent in a person-to-person -person situation. Their eye is always on the longer term prize. And in general, a Machiavellian person will not mess it up by having a messy little tantrum. Now, not all Machiavellian people are successful. The smart ones and the lucky ones and the rich ones are, and they go on to become senators and presidents 
and ambassadors and CEOs and really successful entrepreneurs. I guess that dumb Machiavellian people may end up in jail because their manipulative play doesn't quite work out or they get kicked out of school maybe for cheating or their, their entrepreneurial scheme just doesn't work out. Machiavellianism is something you may see in someone running a sort of really well thought out Ponzi scheme or, or a pyramid scheme and they manage to get out right before they get caught. I guess the stupid ones stay in the game too long. Machiavellian folks tend to be serial offenders and they will go from thing to thing, always with their own egocentric plan to run the world in mind. It all sort of has a Dr. Evil kind of vibe. Now there is a core set of characteristics, lack of empathy, callousness, entitlement, need for power, that cuts across narcissism and psychopathy and Machiavellianism. But then it all starts heading off in different directions. The narcissists bless their fragile hearts. They need more attention and admiration. The psychopaths can be a bit more impulsive and hot-headed when things aren't going their way. The Machiavellians are more focused on their methodical end game. And all together, all of this comes together in something called the dark triad, a sort of a personality cluster we've talked about. Nowadays, it's referred to the as the dark tetrad, you just throw sadism in there to round it out. I personally think it should be the dark pentagon, throw paranoia in there as well. Now, Machiavellianism is nasty and can take narcissism and really nasty it up. When Machiavellianism combines with narcissism, then we are seeing more of malignant narcissists, that dark tetrad stuff, right? People may really get at hurt by this, for example, at work. And if you work with someone who's Machiavellian, they will definitely throw you under the bus if it works for, the, if it works for them and they don't care if they ruin your career. But frankly, you may not realize it. All of us are harmed by Machiavellianism. American politics and politicians are basically the dog feces on the bottom of our shoes these days, and I'd say in many areas of the world. These politicians are people who claim to be championing the rights of citizens and in fact are largely just forwarding their own cause and their quest for domination and constantly harming the public trust. All of us living in this mess of a world right now are being hurt by people who have Machiavellian and personalities and who really are the ones who have made this mess that the rest of us have to live in. We reward these folks and we keep giving them more and more power. We've always had this sort of sick admiration for people who so cleverly work systems. I Am Watching Billions love the show and almost every single character on the show is Machiavellian. They calmly play a long game until they get caught and many don't get caught. They write the laws and design them so they can't get caught. And that is one hell of a long game in a very rigged casino. So that exploitative, manipulative, throw you under the busness of some ambitious people represents Machiavellianism. And while lots of narcissistic people may have this pattern, many don't. And many Machiavellian people just don't need the attention. They simply need the power. Pay attention because it can be stunning to realize how disposable you can be to someone like this. Machiavellian people may be really impressive at first blush. They're at the top of their game. Game. Some people are like, oh my gosh, they're so ambitious. They're so driven. They're so focused. They'll do anything to get there. You better believe they'll do anything to get there. And destroying you is definitely something that's on that list if that's what's going to get them to where they're getting to. Not so sure that everybody who's so assiduous in the pursuit of a goal and not caring whether they hurt someone else is really worth our admiration. Now today we're going to be talking about a personality style that you may not be as familiar with even though you've heard the words, which is a sadistic dominant personality style. Yeah, not pretty. So just when you thought personality styles couldn't get darker than the psychopathic style, here's the sadistic dominant style. This, in this particular style, we see a lot of shared features, not only with psychopathy, 
but also with narcissism. There's this additional piece though, which is this the focus on the gratification that the person with this personality style gets or experiences when they humiliate another person. Now, sadistic dominant personality is not a personality disorder. It's actually a style that has been sort of floated out there as a possible other personality style to consider. And Theodore Milan and his model of personality has talked about the style, but I think it bears mentioning and, and as, as something we talk about when we talk about personality, because it gets at some of these sorts of top notes that relate to the more toxic parts of narcissism. When we think about the sadistic dominant personality style, we're seeing things like willful cruelty, dominance, intimidation, humiliation, um, demeaning, and then a person who restricts the freedoms of another person. So this is somebody who is cruel, confines somebody, intimidates them, humiliates them, and at some level gets gratification from that. Now, when we talk about narcissism and the sadistic dominant style, as you can imagine, there is some overlap here. here. At some level, people who have a narcissistic personality style, though, seem um, kind of tame next to this particular sadistic dominant backdrop. And like I said, sadistic dominant, there's no such thing as sadistic personality disorder. It's been floated out there as an idea, but it's not an existing personality disorder in the diagnostic symptoms. It, this actually gets into sort of a sense of this spectrum of personality traits that hang together in this really, really sort of interpersonally lethal manner. Now, some of the overlapping themes that we see between the sadistic dominant style and narcissism include that need for dominance, the, um, the tendency to, the tendency towards intimidation of another person, the tendency towards control, all kinds of patterns that tend to overlap more with the malignant narcissistic style. The tricky bit when we're taking on understanding a sadistic dominant style is sort of the why. When we see these kinds of sort of intimidation, humiliation, degradation kinds of patterns show up in narcissism, it tends to be associated in narcissism, again, with attempts to offset and defend against the insecurity and the inadequacy that's such a part of the narcissistic personality sort of props up the ego. The person feels larger because they're harming somebody else. In a sadistic personality style, when we see these kinds of patterns, it tends to be more in the realm of sort of a psychopathic detachment from all that is sort of really human and humane. So I think in the sadistic personality style, these patterns are much, much more sort of almost like a, a schism or a dissociation from what is considered sort of the functioning human character. In narcissism, if we were to see these patterns of dominance and cruelty and intimidation, it tends to take on more of a function of tamping down those feelings of inadequacy when they come up. Now, if we were to look at the sadistic dominant style and look at people who have, who have experienced narcissistic abuse, as you can imagine, these kinds of patterns we see in the sadistic dominant personality pattern could cause tremendous distress and psychological trauma or harm for the person who is sort of in the wake of these patterns. And since we do see that some of the patterns we see in the sadistic dominant style overlap with narcissism, particularly malignant narcissism, then what that means is that you can imagine that people who are exposed to these kinds of sadistic patterns as part of their narcissistic abuse, it's much more likely to result in a sort of a traumatic presentation. In most cases, this would be what is seen in terms of the overlap between what is traditionally viewed sort of as domestic violence, especially sort of the physical violence, the psychological control, the financial control, the coercive control. A lot of that gets taken up in this sadistic dominant style. And we know this has tremendously poor outcomes for people who experience narcissistic abuse against this backdrop. The idea that a person behaves like this with little recognition or even caring about the harm that they're doing to someone else is actually very unsettling for a, a victim of this. So the idea that somebody who could be, could be willfully sadistic and so controlling and dominant with absolutely no sense of the harm it's causing for someone else 
it almost leaves someone feeling like they're literally in the presence of evil, for lack of a better word. And when a person is in the presence of that, it almost feels unbelievable to them and can be very, very difficult to sort of recover as a, pro, uh, as a, as a, um, recover as a, as a, you know, as a sort of a goal, because it is, it, for many people, they'll feel sort of shocked. And I mean, in the most extreme cases, you could have people who have in strong traumatic reactions that could persist for many, many, many years, especially if they don't get adequate help. Now, in terms of a person with a sadistic dominant style, what's the treatment? Much like with psychopathy, there's little evidence that anything would really work here. There would have to be an awareness that this is even wrong. And one thing we do see in people with a sadistic dominant style, there's absolutely no awareness. In the absence of that awareness, there's very little likelihood that treatment would work. However, if somebody's experiencing these patterns and is saying, well, this isn't okay, I need to get help, then getting help is essential. There's not many people who focus on this, but somebody who's really got well-developed skills for working in the realm of psychopathy would actually probably be a great place to start. And for more information on this pattern, please go to the links in the video notes and you might get more information. Again, not so much is known about this. And if anything, a lot of the, the what we've learned about sadistic and dominant styles comes more from what we call case literature, where one case is written about. And a lot of folks with these styles, when they're finally found out, do tend to end up in long-term incarceration settings or long-term um, locked psychiatric facilities. So it's, it's, it's sort of a bleak picture, but some of those patterns, the intimidation, the cruelty, the humiliation, that those sorts of patterns are sometimes seen in malignant narcissism. So understanding it as a personality type can definitely forward our understanding of narcissistic patterns. Yep, so okay. here's the question for you today. Can narcissists evolve into psychopaths? What do you think? Drop your answers in the comments. What do you think? Drop your answers in the comments. Can narcissistic people evolve into psychopaths? Well, this is a real question. I'm trying to imagine like the fish coming out of the evolutionary sea and standing up as psychopath, right? Well, the narcissism versus psychopathy conversation is a popular one as people try to make sense of the toxic and the antagonistic people in their lives and try to determine whether the person or people in their lives are full on narcissistic or whether it might be something even more sinister like psychopathy. Now, narcissism and psychopathy are both personality styles with lots of overlaps. The overlaps are things like the lack of empathy, the entitlement, the grandiosity, the arrogance, the incapacity for true intimacy, treating other people as objects to get their needs met. But the place where narcissism and psychopathy diverge is pretty major. Narcissism is very much built on a foundation of insecurity and fragility. Narcissistic people are thin-skinned, reactive, and very, very sensitive to any form of feedback, criticism, anything like that. Narcissistic people can also feel guilty, ashamed, and remorseful when they do bad things or get caught, not necessarily from a place of empathy, but because that bad thing they did makes them look bad, but they know when they've done a bad thing and they tend to get a little bit shamey at those times. Now, psychopathy, we don't see the fragile insecurity there. We may see a sort of paranoid reactivity at times, things like, you looking at me, kind of thing. Anything that feels like a challenge to their authority, but it's not about hurt, sensitive feelings per se, like we'd see in narcissism. And the ringer is the lack of remorse. Psychopathic people don't feel bad when they do bad things. They barely know that they're bad things. They just do them because it's what works for them and allows them to maintain power and dominance. Narcissistic people know what empathy is and are capable of cognitive empathy and even what can even pass for niceness when they're having a really good day and they feel secure and they're well supplied. Now in psychopathy, what we see is very shallow and superficial charm but nothing that even has a slight whiff of empathy. Because there are some clear distinctions between the styles, there is little likelihood that a narcissistic person will evolve into psychopathy. In fact, there is literature supporting the idea that psychopathic people start to mellow with age. I mean, some level of criminality takes energy, right? It's, it's, it's a little hard to run a hustle. We get tired as we become older. They don't become sweet, but the psychopaths may not be as dangerous. 
Now, malignant narcissism is where the psychopathy narcissism overlap is the most pronounced. And then we veer into the territory of the dark tetrad, narcissism, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and sadism. I'm a big fan of the tetrad model because it does make allowances for how much overlap there is between all of this, rather than trying to chop it all up into psychopathy versus narcissism. I think there is so much overlap. Now, psychopathic people tend to either end up in prison or as they get older, devoid of any meaningful contacts, especially later in life. They may end up in nursing homes if they end up having enough money later in life or maybe someone in their home that cares for them. Some psychopathic folks end up without a place to live or go, and they're very, very unlikely to have supports around them other than people who are paid to be with them. Now, narcissistic people do keep people in their lives. They may be as mean as they always are, just as critical or me, me, me as they are, but narcissistic people are more likely to have marriages, children, to stay in touch with families, and so there are more eyes on them as they get older. Narcissistic older adults tend to think that they are more capable of being able to do things than they are. They remain very selfish and they tend to burn out the people who are living with them or caring for them. The tricky bit with these antagonistic and toxic personality styles like narcissism and psychopathy is the level of overlap. So it's really difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. I've worked with tons of narcissistic clients in my practice, some of whom were really mean. I have never worked with somebody psychopathic in my clinical practice. All of the narcissistic clients that I've ever worked with, that insecurity was close to the bone and ready to pop out all the time. As you can imagine, psychopathic folks rarely end up in therapy. If they do, it tends to be court mandated or it's happening in a prison setting. Genetics play a role too, and there's a stronger evidence base on the genetics of psychopathy, and there's also neuroimaging research showing that psychopathy has some clear neural substrates. That research support is also really lacking when it comes to narcissism. It was interesting because I was, you know, when I was thinking of this video, this idea, can narcissism go to psychopathy? Well, I was reading a news story today. It's about this guy. The guy, like, kills an employee then he proceeded to kill his own family members to distract from his other murder and then used other misfortunes that his family was associated with to create a better alibi. There was seemingly literally no remorse, like he was killing family members just to protect himself. But by all reports, this person was valued as a business person in his community. That picture feels more psychopathic. And a reminder that psychopathic people can not only hide in plain sight, just like narcissistic people, they can flourish in plain sight. However, with age, these styles tend to soften on the edges, like I said, because it takes a fair amount of energy to be an asshole, let alone a dangerous one. But the, now back to the original point of the video is can that narcissistic person jump the rails into full-on psychopathy? Not likely. Think of it as like there's a canyon between narcissism and psychopathy. You're not going to be able to jump that canyon. Definitely over time there's change, but it's definitely narciss not narcissism becoming psychopathy. That's not a normal evolution. It's very likely that some of the tracks on psychopathy might even be set pretty early in life because there is a sort of a genetic and temperamental piece to this. There is a temperamental piece to narcissism as well, but like I said, they tend to go in very different directions. We tend to see different childhoods, but one, one might wonder like, oh, enough for, for, it's, like, it's like a diamond, right? Put enough pressure on carbon, you'll get a diamond. If you put enough pressure on narcissism, you're not going to get psychopathy. You're just going to get a more difficult narcissistic person, but that, that insecurity will remain psychopathy, an entirely different beast. So just as you, just when you were thinking that difficult personalities couldn't get more complicated, it gets more complicated. Now, there was a very interesting study I had the privilege to read from someone named Nadja Haim in the, in the United Kingdom. And she wrote this paper with her colleagues, both in the United Kingdom and in New Zealand. And in this paper, they describe a pattern called the dark empath. Now, to understand the dark empath, 
you first have to understand something that's even more scary, and that's called the dark triad. The dark triad is a sort of toxic stew of three patterns, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. This work on the dark triad has been done and presented by researchers including Paulus, Jones, and Hare. And the dark triad is a model in which these three different patterns, these three difficult patterns of narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism hang together. It's a pattern characterized by exploitativeness, manipulation, superficial charm, callousness, unethical or illegal behavior or and illegal behavior, entitlement, grandiosity, arrogance, and lack of empathy. In other words, not a nice pattern. And many of you watching this video may have been hurt by people who had these really dark, dangerous patterns. So now imagine a person who has some of these dark patterns, but may also have what looks like empathy. Yikes. The ability, and what is empathy? The ability to be aware of the needs of another person and sometimes even respond to them. But at the same time with that empathy, they can also be manipulative and selfish. And this takes us into the world of the dark empath described by Hain and her colleagues. Personally, I find a dark empath to be more terrifying than a person who is a dark triad person. With a dark triad person, I know to be scared. A dark triad person doesn't even try to fake empathy. So there's a sort of an abrupt, menacing, dangerous feel to them. So as long as you don't get tricked by the charm, and by now you should all know a charm is dangerous. As long as you don't get tricked by the charm, you're okay. But the dark empath, that's really much more problematic. And it may get to the core of how and why people get pulled into narcissistic relationships. Listen, any of you who've been in a narcissistic relationship, you aren't stupid. You're not masochistic. You didn't set out to find someone who didn't have empathy or didn't say, hey, I'm gonna start dating and I'm gonna look for someone abusive. If you got into a toxic relationship, it snuck up on you over time because there may actually have been something that did feel like empathy earlier in the relationship. The person may have been intently learning about you, studying you, responding in a way that appeared to show some interest or at least some level of understanding of your emotions. But then pretty soon thereafter, you saw the manipulativeness, the callousness, the entitlement, and the patterns that go with that, the gaslighting, the invalidation. But you say to yourself, this can't be narcissism. There was a little bit of empathy here. Like now you're confused, right? This research that these folks have done on the dark empath shows us that it's not that simple. The researchers use this term because the dark empaths in their study, the way they measured them, they definitely had more empathy than the dark triad people, but they didn't have more empathy than traditional empaths or just regular typical folks. But they had, they had some, much more than a traditional psychopathically narcissistic person, just enough to trick someone. And empathy is also a complicated trait. Empathy isn't just about crying with someone else or feeling someone else's pain. There is what is termed affective empathy. It's also, we call it emotional empathy. That's that sort of emotionally connected empathy, but there's also something called cognitive empathy. This is sort of more of an intellectual understanding of someone else's emotions or experience. I can understand why you feel that way. That's an example of cognitive empathy. I often think that cognitive empathy isn't that satisfying. It can feel sort of intellectual and sort of distant rather than the empathy of someone who really feels connected to you emotionally and seems to genuinely care. Even if the person didn't even ever have the emotional experience you're sharing, they seem to be able to be present with that. You don't see that as much in cognitive empathy. But the big risk of a person who is able to combine empathy and these dark traits is manipulation. Their empathic abilities of the, of the dark empath can be used to almost download what makes another person tick and then weaponize or mobilize that knowledge to take advantage of or manipulate another person. In that way, they're actually like really good salespeople. To know what makes another person tick 
you need to pay attention to them and you need to take a minute to get to know them. The dark empath is much better at that than the dark triad person would ever be. In fact, the dark triad type person is more likely to get what they want through menace or threat or fear or passive aggression. While the dark empath may get it by creating a sense of false trust and then being a more effective manipulator as a result. This concept of the dark empath may actually explain why people fall in love with narcissists and then feel blindsided when it goes upside down because at one point you did feel understood by this dark empath. Dark empaths are extroverted. So they do well in a crowd, which can also foster a sense of trust because you're like, hey, they seem to be getting along with everyone. And since our society and our culture, at least in the United States, tend to be much more pro-extrovert and anti-introvert, people who can do well in a crowd are often judged through a bit of a halo effect. They must be good. They get along with everyone. It's this tricky combination of having high extroversion empathy, and then still having some of those dark triad type, type patterns. So they, this kind of dark empath will still appear egocentric and still behave badly in relationships. The other issue is that dark empaths are also lower in a trait called agreeableness. In fact, Paulus, that researcher I mentioned before, he actually characterizes grandiose narcissists as disagreeable extroverts. So I actually think dark empaths may just be a twist on that. Agreeableness is my favorite trait. It's a trait characterized by empathy, humility, modesty, trust, and interpersonal flexibility. So when a person is lower in agreeableness while also having some empathy means that this is a person who's boastful, arrogant, distrustful, and kind of takes a it's my way or the highway kind of path. And in general, the opposite of agreeableness is antagonism, which is the trait that links the dark empaths and the dark triads. See how that works? Puzzle starting to fit. The authors of this study I'm talking about make a very important point. Just having empathy isn't good enough. Empathy isn't just like a magic disinfectant that cleans away all of the interpersonally uncomfortable patterns of narcissism and being politically Machiavellian and psychopathic. Antagonistic people are antagonistic people. Some just have a little more empathy. They're still very difficult and manipulative. This research on the dark empath may actually clarify why people fall for narcissists in the first place. They have just enough empathy to draw people close, but not enough to result in consistently treating them well. The dark empath may very well be the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. I really love their, their research study because I think it speaks to how nuanced these patterns are and it really gave an interesting framework to think about this idea of the dark empath, to think about how people fall in love with narcissists in the first place and then end up in this really toxic relationship with somebody incredibly egotistical and egocentric. Their research really sheds a lot of light, on, light, sheds a lot of light on that. So thanks again. I, if any of you have ever met a dark empath, drop that in the comments because now you might have a way to explain how this person with empathy was also kind of awful. Thanks again.